all for being here today. I really appreciate it. My name is Deb Sosha. And as Mayor Burke so nicely mentioned from the stage, uh, I do run a nonprofit called Next Century Cities that works with cities and towns across the country that either have or want to have fast, affordable, reliable broadband. For me, it's an equity issue. It's why I do this work. Um, I had previously worked on digital inclusion efforts, uh, and this is just the next step in that effort because not only do we have places where internet is unaffordable, we also have places where it's unavailable. And so uh, to me as a country, if we want to be prosperous, we need to ensure that we've got ubiquitous access. So that's the work that I do. So I am very lucky today to be joined by Mayor Burke of Chattanooga, whom I'm sure you all just listened to, uh, also an inaugural member of the Next Century Cities, Chattanooga is a member. Um, and then we have Elliot Noss, who is the CEO at Two Cows and Ting, and you'll tell us a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And Sheila Dugan, who is the Senior Implementation Advisor at Johns Hopkins. And next to her is Amy Meacham, the Director of External Affairs at Broadband USA, part of NTIA and the Department of Commerce. Got it right? Yep. Okay. So uh, we're going to take, we're going to start, jump right into questions. And as I ask questions, I'll ask people to tell us a little bit more about what they're doing, um, and uh, uh, so that we can keep this conversational. Okay. So we'll start, uh, Mayor Burke, because we we just heard your keynote. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the reason Chattanooga chose to build a gig network and the ways in which you have seen it change your city. So I don't want to speak for too long because you all heard my shtick here just a few minutes ago. And I uh, also want to say, for those of you who don't know Deb, she's spectacular and I just do whatever she tells me to do. Um, um, the, um, so Chattanooga was building a, um, actually building a smart grid through a city, through the municipally owned uh, uh, utility. And um, the smart grid, for those of you who don't know, basically goes to everybody that's on the meter and helps with things like reliability and usage and all kinds of other stuff. And so you're building this fiber, and this Deb will tell you fiber is the key to all this. And as we had this fiber, we said, okay, you can do all kinds of other things in addition to the smart grid with this fiber, like what else should we do? And um, the answer was, hey, we can do data and video and phone and all these these other things. So um, I think that it, it sounds more intentional, but nobody had done it. We Lafayette and Chattanooga were really the first two. And so um, now it seems a little bit more obvious than it did at the time, but, um, but that was the decision. So we had really smart people at our utility. That's the main answer. And then how does it change our city? I think um, uh, we do fiber for two reasons. One is we do it for economic development, and the second is that we do it for equity. Um, we want to build a city that has a growing middle class and is more prosperous. Um, you got to have a diverse economy, including tech world, uh, people to start that. And by the way, every business now is a tech business. Right? That's just reality. And the second part is the equity, and that is goes to every single home and business, and that gives us a platform really to talk to people about what are the skills that you need to either watch that cat video that you want, order some food uh, on the internet, um, apply for a job, what across a wide variety of things, uh, you know, that's that's necessary. And it also gives us a chance to um, help skill people up and say, as we have this growing, vibrant tech economy, Chattanooga is a place where you should be thinking about how do I become a part of that. I, I have to say, going to Chattanooga, uh, the entire community seems proud of the Absolutely. gig network and of the experience and the change there. From the person that drives your cab to the person at the at the register in the grocery store, they all know about it. They all talk about it. There's just a sense of pride in Chattanooga that it's just visceral. You can feel it when you walk through the door. Okay, so let's let's ask Elliot. Uh, at, I'll, I'm gonna ask you a question, but I'd like you to tell folks a little bit about Two Cows and Ting and what you do. But um, what's interesting to me about the work that you're doing is that we haven't seen a lot of public-private partnerships that have been developed that have been really successful. 
Uh, it's a hard thing to do, and yet you have done it quite successfully. Uh, two of the cities I work with, Centennial, Colorado, um, and in Maryland, Westminster, Westminster uh, have both been quite successful. So I'd love to have you tell us a little about what you do and then talk about those projects. Sure. Uh, you know, I'd start with, you know, we're a company that's been around for a long time. I've been in the same role for 20 years. This is now uh, two cows. You know, we've done a bunch of things. Uh, the largest kind of non-telecom is we're the uh, largest wholesaler of domain names in the world, second largest registrar in the world. All that, uh, and we have a mobile phone business and MVNO. Those businesses uh, just spin off cash that we've been lucky enough to be able to use to lay fiber. You know, I, I say we've got these two great businesses and we just use the cash to put glass in the ground. You know, aren't we lucky? Um, we're uh, uh, really very agnostic about uh, network ownership. What we love to do is that last piece of connecting up uh, people you know, with the Internet, providing customer service, providing a great user experience. You know, what we do at a network level, who owns it, uh, that allows us to you know, look at that as just kind of a capital deployment choice. And so uh, every mayor I meet with, and boy, I've met with now a few dozen mayors, um, I start by saying, you know, if I were you, I'd own the network. But, you know, if you can't do it at a practical level, and boy, would you appreciate this, you know, it's difficult if you're uh, a city government. There are real challenges administratively, economically, bureaucratically, around running your own network. So, you know, if you're not going to do it, you're going to let me deploy my capital, that's fine. You know, we'll look at that too. You know, I think when you say those are successes, I really think we are just in the very, very beginning of figuring out, uh, you know, what public-private partnerships can look like. You know, Charlottesville is our first fiber market. It's our biggest fiber market, but still only a couple of years old. Just Quick level set. How many people in this room are not from Charlottesville? So it's still uh, so a lot. So you know we've been we bought a small local uh, um, uh, business here that was doing fiber. You know needed capital, needed some operational uh, uh, breadth, uh, and that's been you know that's been very successful. And and we've been here. You know we were lucky enough. We found a great company. We were lucky enough that that was here in Charlottesville, which is a great city. Uh, so here we've had no relationship at all with the city. In fact, the mayor and I met for the first time today. Um, and, and there's, so there's, you know, even there, just as a purely private, you know, no public relationship, you know, it's amazing. We start to talk about, hey, there's cool things we can do. What do you want done? Here's things we're thinking about. And for a mayor, that's just antithetical to their previous relationship with telecom. And, uh, you know, I guess we're just lucky enough to, Kind of come with a fresh set of eyes, and 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 so I think that you know we'll all learn together over the next few years. You know what works best. Right, and speaking of which, if you're all on the network that they keep advertising, switch. Yeah. Go to Ting at TomTom. Tom. Yeah. And I say that I think it's our pipe behind both, but they put as network administrators often do some weird security in front of it, and one will basically you know spit out packages through a little choked straw, and the other might be the fastest internet you get all year. So. so make that decision. Yeah. It's good decision. <laughs> okay, so um, Sheila, look, when I first met you, you were working at Everyone On, which is a national nonprofit, really working on issues of digital equity across the country. And now you're at Johns Hopkins. So I'm going to ask you at the beginning to tell us a little bit about that work. But then I'd like you to talk a little bit about what the state of connectedness is in this country, in the cities, in the rural communities, in the tribal communities. And uh, in particular, the kind of impact that that has. So, um, to give you a little bit more about my background, I feel like I lived a couple of lives. I worked on a variety of digital inclusion initiatives, first in the state of Virginia with your lovely Secretary of Technology, Karen Jackson, then in the state of South Carolina, and I met Deb at the national nonprofit Everyone On, and we really focused on this digital divide in our country. And I keep on, even though I'm not day to day, I don't grapple with this issue, I go back and it seems like the stats remain the same. Not everyone's online. Everyone's about everyone's using the internet, um, according to Pew, the majority of adults, but only around 73% of adults have home access to broadband. 
Why does home access matter when you have a little computer in your phone? Well, ever try to write a resume on that computer? Ever try to access distance learning um, content on your little phone? You're not getting the same um, quality of experience when you're doing it on the phone. So home broadband matters. And so if you're thinking about 73% of those adults that have access to service, that's a high number, but that means there are 27% of adults that don't have access to home broadband, according to Pew. And then when you start um, digging deeper into those numbers, um, you see some disparities in minority communities between black households, Hispanic households. If you're making under 30K a year, you're less likely to have home access to broadband as well. So it's a persistent issue, unfortunately, that keeps on coming up. And I do, in my current position, I work with cities on a variety of data-related initiatives. And when you're talking to mayors and city managers across the country, in towns like Jackson, Mississippi, and places like Cambridge, they're all grappling with this issue of access in a variety of ways. Right, because when you're using data as a city, whose data do you have but the folks with access? So that really changes the data you receive and the way you can use it. Yeah. Right, that's absolutely true. Uh, Amy, so uh, NTIA had uh, the incredible job of managing the stimulus grants a while back um, for broadband infrastructure and digital inclusion work. Can you tell us a little bit about that work, what your continuing work is, and what kind of supports you can offer to cities, and what you're seeing happening there? Sure. So NTIA, for those of you who probably don't know, is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, so it's a mouthful, and we're housed in the Department of Commerce, and we're the principal advisor on internet and technology issues to the administration, whatever administration that is. So most of us span multiple administrations. Uh, the Recovery Act funds spent, gave us about $4 billion to spend in infrastructure, sustainable broadband adoption, as Sheila was talking about. Adoption includes uh, digital inclusion and uh, public computing centers, one of the access issues that Sheila just mentioned as well, across the U.S. Deb was actually one of our grantees in Boston and at her pre and next century cities days. And they had a great project. You should ask her about that when we're done. <laughs> but. We, um, we spent about $3 billion of that money in infrastructure across the U.S. in um, various size uh, projects. A lot of them were public-private partnerships. Some of them were city or county-led, and some of them were private industry-led. And um, with a variety of results around the country, but mostly you are now seeing a lot of um, economic development in areas that there may not have been development before. Um, in northern Virginia, or not in northern, Virginia, northern Georgia, for example, um, they were able to bring a data center into an area in the mountains that hadn't ha was starting to lose industry. They were able to keep some manufacturing because of the broadband. Um, in, uh, along the eastern Sierra in California, you're starting to see some really um, interesting hubs of innovation along areas that are very uh, tribal and rural. And so we're really excited about, about that. Now that program was actually what we call about nine times oversubscribed. Um, applicants had 45 days, so these are the folks that actually knew about the program and could apply in time, Not, uh, nine times over the $4 billion. So folks came to us and have come to us over the last few years saying, look, you're still around, what can you do for us? And so we created Broadband USA to help folks in a variety of ways and see what we could do with um, counties, uh, cities, and other government entities. So we work a lot with like rural economic districts and uh, states as well on a, on a variety of issues. And so we do that through a couple a couple sources, so one-on-one -on -one technical consulting, both on broadband infrastructure and on digital inclusion, in uh, focusing on sort of the simplified stages of a project, planning, funding, and implementing those projects. We work, um, so if you guys need one-on-one -on -one technical assistance or the federal government, it's free. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me or... Um, or Deb knows how to get a hold of us, but we, you know, we're happy to look and see how we can help you with that. Uh, we provide a number of guides and tools, and we really are sort of technology agnostic and solution neutral. So whatever solution works for your community is, you know, what we will help support. And I brought a couple samples of the guides and tools as well. And then we put events on around the country. Um, next week, Deb actually is putting on an event in Arizona, and we are going to have like a, a small technical assistance uh, event the next day on planning and funding uh, broadband, or broadband infrastructure projects. Thanks, Amy. 
So, that, you know, there are resources out there if your community is looking to do this work, and Next Century Cities and Broadband USA are, are two of those resources. Mayor Burke, back to you. So I have a question about, so you have gig access, and I, we heard you talk about the disparity issue between uh, folks who are using it and folks who are not. But, but how has it changed the way that your community interacts with government? Has it, and if it has, how? Yeah, so it, it's changed it. Obviously, when you have access, then um, we spend a lot of time figuring out how we deliver services more efficiently, and that there's no question about that. And um, we're you talk about data. We were one of the first four um, what work cities under Bloomberg philanthropies, and we we we're doing a bunch of interesting data work about you know looking at broadband, how we deploy it. We're also using that data work on things like um, police recruitment and um, sewer billing and things of that nature. So we're, we're trying to we're trying to deploy it in every way possible. I think we haven't, honestly, haven't seen um, the kind of, of use of gig by government to deliver services that we will see. Um, I think that still those days are still to come. When when I, I imagine this day when so we have this thing, Baby University, which we're really proud of, fantastic, and what it is is uh, basically for um, for kids, for mothers who are pregnant, um, we get them into this, and it's helping them overcome the challenges that they see every day. It's just hardcore social work basically for mothers uh, who are low income and making sure that they get into high quality uh, early learning. And you could easily see something where if we knew that they had um, the connection, that they used it, they used it properly, um, that all of a sudden we could be pushing out content to all those mothers at the same time um, through, through the gig. We're not there yet. That's very frustrating to me, as people who work for me will tell you. Um, but but we're you know we're getting closer because stage one, as you know, is we're making sure all those um, all the people who go through KBU are turning on their um, their gig and then making sure that they know how to use it properly. And then that that will give us the platform to again now start pushing out wellness content uh, at the same time every day. So and then letting them have find ways to interact with each other because actually those peer experiences are just as important as the ones that they get from our social workers. Yep. And, and there are projects out there that talk about how, how do you help children improve their kindergarten readiness skills through training and technology and support, and that's a, a helpful piece. Elliot, so I'm guessing we're not all technically savvy in the room. Can you explain the difference between cellular service and Wi-Fi? And can you, um, then you, you touched on this, Sheila, but I'd love to have us talk a little bit more about smartphones and whether they are a solution um, and what are the shortfalls of using them as a solution for ensuring everybody gets online. First of all, after you explain the difference between Wi-Fi and cellular, will you call my wife? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, like I pay that data bill. You are you were the, you were the <laughs> first uh, uh, you know, person who has not asked me to call their daughter. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's excellent. Uh, you know, and, and, and Sheila, with apologies, I'm going to step all over your answer because because you know it's one of my great frustrations uh, that uh, you know. That you said cellular. I, I like to say mobile for a very particular purpose. You know, everything is wireless. We're all on wireless now, whether it's fixed Wi-Fi or or uh, mobile. The, the, you know, with with mobile, too often people push mobile as a solution for connectivity. It is way more expensive and way less reliable. And those two things. You know, the simplest way I get people to understand this. You know, if you think about a mobile network, I've got this phone in my hand. I can pretty much go anywhere on the planet Earth, and subject to my carrier's roaming capabilities and deals, I'll be able to use this phone. I could be sitting, you know, in the Himalayas, and to some extent, depending on how far up the mountains I get, I've got coverage, and there's a billing relationship that'll solve that. Fixed internet usually ends at the driveway. 
because of that, you know, as you're driving along in your car, going from place to place, you know, the, the, the network is holding state. It's letting you do that with continuity. That's expensive. You know, the network has to spend resources to do that. With a fixed network, there is no spending of those resources. And if you kind of go the, the, to the next level, if you think about when you're really using compute, when you're really using the network, very, very rarely is that when you're in a state of mobility. You know, 90 plus percent of almost all of our interactions with the network are at home, at work, in a coffee shop, in a fixed place. And, and you know, it's, it, it, there's, there's this use case that is this fictional use case that incumbent telecoms put out, you know, which is people watching video in a mobile, you know, no, it, it's kind of this vision of people watching TV on their phones, which is just not real. So I'm saying that people aren't watching some video, it's usually YouTube, or not watching, you know, or not using Snapchat or Instagram, but it's, 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 a, it's a misconceived sort of description. And that's really important because, you know, mobile networks are simply not a substitute. Slower, more reliable, way more expensive for exactly the people who need faster, more reliable, less expensive, high compute power. And that's my segue to you. Uh, yes. Why? <laughs> so I'm going to interject sure. one thing about that, and that is that we keep hearing, uh, you know, that wireless uh, mobile networks are going to be the solution for cities ah. and, and rural communities. And yeah. so that's a part of the reason for so the question. Let me right? warn you about the coming scam, because I see it, you know, in the way, potentially, that the new FCC policy is evolving. I feel like a lot of statements that have been buried in the roadmap and the pronouncements right now are set up for giving massive amounts of government money to incumbents to build out their private 5G networks. And, and it just feels like this is all uh, uh, being laid out like that. You know, boy, oh, watch for that, you know, on the NTIA side. You know, I can tell you, in, in the BTOP program, where net net, it was a great program, and I thought it was super well intended. But there was this huge administrative mistake of, of kind of putting this this administrative overhead in the in the in the name of protecting the money to see that it was spent well, which ended up just kind of feeding a consulting class that almost just tithed off of that money, and and you know it, 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 it's 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 a fear of mine that we're going to be seeing this again. You know, with that story. So, can I say two things to that? So, yeah. one, I mean, you should. I'm the sorry. administrative I overhead is regulatory, yeah. and I'm not a, you know, I, I, I couldn't change that. Yeah, I was, I was not pointing no, fingers no, no. at but all. It, is, but. it does create issues, and, it, and yeah. it slows down deployment on an infrastructure build, for example. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, one thing I, one thing I like to say is, you're gonna, you know, you'll hear a lot about 5G and the promise of 5G, and there's really, I think, you know, one, the standard doesn't exist yet. Um, so they're coming up with a standard. It will exist in a couple years. But but two, what isn't said as much is wireless requires wires. And so 5G deployment, every, you know, every microcell tower that, you know, that Can goes... Can I jump in and just yeah. say mobile requires Mo wires? Well, mobile, yes. It, I like to, no, you know, I'll, that, that wording the, is so important, the whole thing, but, but, but 5G requires even more wires, yes. right? It's practically fiber to the home by the time you have... Yeah. Um, because you need it, the way the signal works, it's very short and just to be a little dorky, and it doesn't go very far, but it's going to allow a lot of fast applications like on autonomous vehicles. So it will be really important. You need to do both, but you're going to need the fire, the fiber, or you can't do it at all. Right. And that's important. Oh, I, I mean, I think generally, um, I briefly touched on it around the smartphones because I've worked in a lot of spaces and people, especially look at the trends of how people are getting online, they thought that the smartphone would be the one thing that would close the gap. And when talking about technology, I, I mean, you always take it with a grain of salt because 20 years ago, we didn't think we would have smartphones in our hands. So maybe something will happen in the next couple of years and I'm eating my words. But for people who need to get online now to find jobs, people who need to um, get online now to access 
access content and reach their doctors. Um, the computer is the best way to do it and having a stable home connection because with your smartphone usage, you have to go, go up against data caps as well as, which are expensive, as we all know, from our phone bills. And as well as there's that experience of actually using the phone that can't quite mimic a computer yet. So maybe I'll be eating my words in five, ten years. Maybe, probably not, <laughs> because I feel like this question always comes up on panels. So. It does. It, well, we hear so much from uh, industry about how wireless is going to solve all the problems, and I think we want to be cautious about that. Uh, do you have wireless network in Chattanooga? Sure. And is it free public Wi-Fi? Um, we, we have. Um, we are building out uh, Nuganet um, uh -huh. everywhere throughout the community. Um, and uh, it's in lots of places. And right now, actually, one of our big equity projects is that we're taking a neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and we're we're putting the stuff up right now. But we're um, putting uh, hot spots um, on gathering places throughout the neighborhoods, on churches, and other places throughout the neighborhoods. And then we're going to um, teach people how to. Um, how to fix the, in the community, how to fix the um, Wi-Fi hotspots um, so that we can, they can maintain it themselves and see how that works. I know when I was in Boston, we, put, we uh, wired a neighborhood in particular, a very, very low-income neighborhood. And, and while it's not a solution, it can be part of the solution, right? So it's, it's a part of the mix of ways in which we can support folks with, with low incomes. Especially if you have a phone with a data cap and that's your only device and you can hop on Wi-Fi and, and not hit your data cap, right? So it's part of a solution. So, um, Amy, um, a, a topic that almost came up in the conversation earlier but, but didn't quite get there was this topic of uh, barriers for local cities that are trying to build out networks, right? So uh, we heard about your issue with uh, building beyond Chattanooga's borders, and it's there's some bizarre irony in the fact that you're willing to go across the street, but those folks can only get dial-up, right? There's some irony in that when there's a willingness to do it and there's not an ability. But, but what kinds of barriers are you seeing and what kinds of things do you think cities can do to uh, manage the struggles they get when those barriers come? Are in place. Sure. So there's, I, I think there's not just barriers at the local level, but there's also federal barriers. So let me start there because that's a little, that's a little bit easier for, for me to dive into. But we work with about 25 other federal agencies, and so when Elliot has an issue, which I hope I hope you do come and talk to us about about those with federal with federal issues, like whether it's federal permitting on um, the Bureau of Land Management lands or Department of Interior lands um, at your Park Service, etc. Um, when when there are issues there, we try to work with other federal agencies to work those out. And so we we're actually going to have an industry day that we can talk to you about um, in a, in a couple months, um, where we'll bring in people and on a focused issue. So I want to throw that out there. But I think you know we're pretty, we're neutral in this space, and so what we like to see that works is um, cities. Um, that can. I mean, a lot of cities are strapped for resources and you have limited um, staff to do the permitting. Um, and, and just talking about this at a city level, this, think about um, what's coming down the pike, certainly we'll, we'll use 5G as an example, is there's going to be tons of permit requests. They're not going to be for big towers. There's going to be a ton of requests for small for small cell deployment or what, they, what the FCC terms as small cell, which means like 28 meters. So you can decide whether that's small to you or not. Um, but Anyway, they, you, there, there's a lot to think about whether you know whether that process works for these you know for these type of deployments. Um, what type of resources you need, what what your cost recovery might be to cover that, and whether um, you want the same policies in place for that as an example that you did for a 200 foot tower that um, has a you know has sort of a different um, space. <laughs> Looks like a fake tree, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and so. I think those are the types of things, and that's just that's just on the wireless side, not on not on the the, the general right of way side. So the rights of way, I think, um, general like business practices. It's I, Andy's probably better equipped to speak about that from a city level since he's he's been doing this. But 
Yeah. If I could just add, we um, in Pennsylvania, from Lancaster City, 60,000 people, we're just starting a municipal broadband ourselves. And that that issue about those towers came up in our ordinance almost immediately because they, um, the companies that were building those towers wanted to be able to put them anywhere and they saw that as a public right of theirs that they didn't have to go through our process in terms of um, you know, getting approval through our historic architecture report and so on. And they, they felt that they could just build these anywhere. And so I think that this is one of those things related to the 5G network that's coming down the pike for cities that we have to get ahead of and really monitor state legislation that would give um, telecommunications companies, especially the big ones, just the right to like run through your city and put up those. So you should join. You should join next century cities. But I'll tell you, there are eighteen either pending or in in situation um, state laws that prohibit local decision making about where they get placed, the aesthetics of them, the safety. This is this. These are in the public right away. And FCC. Right? Yeah. And the FCC mobility has has gone to them, but. Uh, I will say we have on our website that Katie, who works with me here, uh, created with some, a lot of work on pole attachments and also around uh, small cells. So if you're looking for that kind of information, we do have it on our site. It's a complex issue and it's pretty wonky, but we got to know about it as cities because these state level laws are going to impact our capacity to decide whether or not that great big thing, maybe the size of a fridge, is in front of that historical building in your community. There are also 20 states that limit or prohibit cities from doing what Chattanooga did, and that is to build their own network. So uh, that that limitation of local choice is problematic. Uh, I want to just, there's one, if I can just jump in on that, you know, we've had discussions with uh, others, uh, not with Chattanooga, about actually just being their beer for letting them build outside ah. of their borders, because they can kind of use us as a private fig leaf for their <laughs> public network. And, and I mean, you know, we, it, it hasn't come to anything yet, but, you know, hey, if we can help. Yeah. Right? And it's terrible that, you know, you should have to jump through those hoops. But. At the, yeah. I was going to say, and then there's, there's a, I mean, I think you're right. There's a lot of things to think about. And a lot of um, communities have gone completely underground with all of their rights of way utilities. Yeah. And so adding something that's above ground is a, is a whole, adds another layer of complexity. And so, and there's historic areas where you may not want to put um, something on, on the light poles in the historic areas or have the light poles changed out. But right now, you're right, um, certainly the larger carriers are what, what I would call densifying their current networks in order to prepare for the next generation. Do you want to say something about that? So yeah, we I mean we we struggle with this um, too, and and um, you know, I think it's really important to set principles. Like that's the way I start almost every discussion. As y'all probably tell, is like, hey, what are the principles we want to do? How do we figure that out? And then from those principles, what are the what are the action steps that we need to take? Um, and like aesthetics, equity, you know, th those are. When we sat down and talked about small cell, this is this is the discussion that we have. I think, you know, again, going back to the national policy issue, and that is, so like, at some point we just have to figure out, what is it that we want this thing to look like? You know, that's that's really the question. What, what, what do we want this to look like? And then, because we spend a lot of time talking about pole attachments, I usually leave the room when we start talking about pole attachments. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, because the question is, what do... Like, what do we want to happen here? And then how do we design a system that actually makes that occur? Because what, what, what we, we are in a reactive state on this. And I think that's the, that's where people like Deb, who are much smarter than me, come in is, you know, how do we, how do we become proactive about this is what we want to see in our, cities, our states, our, our countries, and here's how we're going to build that out as opposed to, okay, we have dark fiber here, and there's some, you know, and we got hookups here, and we want, and we got small, and we're fighting on every front, you know, some way to figure out how to, how to cobble together some, some, some connections for people. It's like, no, 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 that, that's, in the long run, that's no way to do this. It's too important to do that way. 
my, my opinion. So I, I'd love to hear if there were questions. Yes. Um, my question has to do with uh, kind of the comment that I think the mayor made at the, the biggest session is luxury or right. And it, it struck me there was an earlier panel about um, libraries and the future of libraries. And it seems to me like there's a Venn diagram between some of the issues that you're talking about and some of the things that the libraries are struggling with. And I wonder what you, any on the panel, think about the public good of the library, the public good of access to fiber, and how they might work together. I, I got it. Yeah. So, so there's there's something there that I think is really important. You know, so often the stories in the history, and so here I, it, on this point, I think that is so clear uh, in that. We've delivered the internet to date on infrastructure built for first telephone and then television. And television infrastructure, coax, is what dominates and is winning and winning from. And so now we're applying, you know, we always kind of, you know, do yesterday's story, right? And so the, the, the single biggest um, driver of why I think it's looked at as luxury versus right is because it's extending from television infrastructure. Fiber is the first purpose-built infrastructure for the internet, which is an amazing mouthful when you think about how pervasive the internet is, but we've never built infrastructure for it yet. Right? I mean, to me, that just blows my mind. And so, uh, I, again, if you kind of extend from that, well, it's clearly infrastructure. I mean, I, I say this very publicly to my detriment. I can't believe they let me own this stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're a public company, so it's not me, but you know, you know but it's it's remarkable to me. I mean, you know, good on you. I mean, that's why I think you know what you guys have done is is is, is so brilliant and so important. But I think that until that narrative changes, and I don't expect it to, you know, we're we're stuck with this, and we're stuck with, uh, you know, there's twenty thousand cities and towns in the U.S. I think there's going to be twenty thousand different stories about how they kind of get from here to here. The, the, the solace that I take in that is, you know, when, when you're talking about sort of a national plan or a broader vision, let me, you know, even go sort of sort of a, a more generic than national, you know, I, I have no hope for that. But the internet was not at all that. You know, the internet was just a series of protocols and it was amazingly heterogeneous and it all fit together. So, so kind of there's my hopeful underpinning. Sheila, why don't you talk a little bit about libraries and how they have impacted I think they're um, primary partners for most of your digital inclusion efforts. Even if you do have um, a fantastic network that and low-cost options within your community, um, I've seen, especially in my work at Everyone On, libraries taking the lead in helping educate um, the residents about how to use their devices, um, edu offering um, digital, digital literacy training, and even in places that they quite don't have all of the offers aligned or the infrastructure there. There have been a lot of um, innovations taking place around lending people out um, devices, lending people out um, even actual like um, you know internet service. You put your USB thing into your computer and you have access to the internet. And I think um, regardless of what the futures looks like, I think libraries will always take a central place as a place of learning, and they'll always play a role in this effort. Right, and, and we need to ensure yeah. that the libraries are connected because we still have lots of yeah, libraries in this country with really horrible service and they have been forever the sharer of the world's knowledge yeah. and now we get our knowledge through the internet we you know we have to be careful about that Amy you were going to say something. I was going to say a couple things one we we actually connected a lot of those libraries during the recovery act but there still are a lot of libraries left to connect um, a, lot, a, a big focus of the program was to connect schools and libraries and public institutions. But I mean, I think Sheila's right. Just libraries are really, they're important drivers for the community for, for digital inclusion, and they're, re, they're hubs of innovation in a number of communities, and they're a place um, to, you know, to sort of equalize access, where there's free Wi-Fi in almost every library. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a good place to go and look online for a job, or do your homework, <laughs> or if you, especially if you don't have access at all. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, I was just going to say, yeah. Libraries are repositories of information, and they're places for people to gather and community, right? That's what they've been for forever, and 
and that's what they should be today. And so the, the web has got to be, and broadband has got to be a huge part of that. Chattanooga, our library wins all kinds of awards, which is great because we 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 do this stuff. And that's fantastic. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Fourth floor. Yeah, so, so we have fourth floor. We have our fourth floor is this space that we've turned into this cool space. And it's a lot of um, purposeful um, programming that particularly with um, getting people involved in, in makerspace and things like that. Uh, the, and and our, our, our terminals are filled all day, every day. They're filled all day, every day. But, but, so let me, let me just say, let me get the but in here that nobody has said yet. But um, libraries are still a physical place that people have to get to. And, and the promise of broadband is that it brings this, this knowledge and this ability to do all these things to you and to your home. And the people who are already transportation challenged and already living on the edges, and by the way, as these demographic challenges persist and, and people move, then poverty is going to move out, and then now they're even farther away from things like the libraries, which tend to be in places like the cities. Um, you're going to continue to see this, and it's a greater burden on them to get to the library. And so in the long run, libraries are fantastic and we have to have we have to do all these things that we're talking about, but it but it's not a substitute. It's a it's a it, it's a it's a step in what we have to and, and how we serve people, but we have to break down that barrier in the long run that, that keep that forces them to have to go to the library to do this. As a former educator, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and one of the things I think about is if we don't have the same input, can we possibly get the same output, right? And so uh, equitable home access is really a part of that. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, um, I run an urbanism project at a think tank in D.C. that does a lot of innovation uh, and digital policy. And one of the things that we, you know, just signed a coalition letter on is advocating for uh, dig once policies, where, you know, if uh, somebody's using federal dollars to, you know, do some highway work, they lay down conduits uh, so that you can, you know, you don't have to put fiber in it yet, but you know, you can at least slide it on in later. And so I was wondering if people had a perspective on that, if there are any, um, whenever I. Uh, favor anything, I instantly get really suspicious of it uh, as to your unintended consequences um, or you know, just your thoughts on that policy. Uh, you know, I would say that it's happily bipartisan. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is bipartisan. That, I'll just mention that if you want more information on that again, it's on our site. Um, and it's just sensible because the biggest expense in putting fiber in the ground is digging the hole. If the hole's dug for another purpose, just put the pipe in, right? It's pennies on the dollar. And um, and as you were saying, it can be part of a bigger strategy, right? So I may not be able to connect it today, but I, you know. And I think you'll see, and this goes through cycles, there's, a, there's always some proposed legislation on this issue. So you are not off the mark on... You know, on your thinking that it's pretty universal. So there, there also may need to be some other changes made to like make that happen at a federal level. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. We're trying to develop something in our community on a sort of a public-private partnership. We don't have the luxury of having owning our own utility, but we also recognize that our city has the largest net fiber optic network anywhere through all the light systems, and trying to then create a revenue stream by renting out space on the city's fiber optic network mm -hmm. to for-profit companies that would then take the, the fiber into local neighborhoods but being able to subsidize their their costs by using the revenue that they're paying to rent space to it are there examples of how that's been done in other communities we're going into all kinds of political hurdles with the uh, with one the, the the RFP for everyone having the right to bid on it to Selecting one person to do it, or the in the politics in terms of the city of saying we don't want a private person to do it, we want to do it ourselves. Oh, yeah, all that. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, you know, probably the best thing about being part of the next century city is it doesn't cost anything to join, so you should right. consider yeah, it. But, <laughs> but the thing that's helpful about it is you can ask me that question, I can connect you to three or four cities that have done it before you. 
um, including yours now, right? So, but, but just understanding what they went through and, and telling you the burdens and the challenges, as I do with uh, Mayor Burke when folks are considering building their own, right? So uh, we're agnostic about how you get there. We just want to help you get there. And so we've helped lots of cities write their RFPs and, and assisted. And there are cities that are leasing their dark fiber, lots of them. And uh, it has been quite successful for many. So I'm happy to- Do they use, that lead, do they use the revenue from the lease then put it in some sort of a fund that's then made for grants out to community for education, access, In general, equipment. the ones that I've seen that have been real successful have pretty much invested it back into the network until they were able to get it into the communities that maybe not everybody wants to build to, but there are a lot of models. Okay. Right. I think that's what we've seen as well. Our, our, our projects were basically um, what we would call, like if you think about it in terms of highways, like there's a, there's a super highway which is long haul fiber, there's a middle mile which is like the um, beltway around a community, and then there's, you know, the last mile access roads, right? I mean, most, so we built a lot of the middle mile just for that purpose, and um, you see, a, you know, we're seeing this now, and we also work, our folks work with communities on um, developing RFPs and thinking about how to attract partners in, so that's... Also free resource, right? Exactly. So, free. so I'm going to, I'm going to wrap us up with one question, and that is, um, if you were recommending to a hometown city, right, you know, the size, 100 to a million, 100,000 to a million, um, that wants to ensure that all citizens have broadband access they need at a price they can afford, uh, rather than three steps, because we're running out of time, I'll ask you to give me one thing you think folks should do. What would be the number one thing that you would recommend to a city, and maybe you'd specifically recommend to a mayor? Um. Join uh, next century cities. <laughs> I didn't even pay it. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to. You have to. I would just say, look at the look at the regulatory environment that you operate in. That's really the problem. Is that the regulatory environment is so inconsistent in every single. I mean, we we have y'all should really like. We fill our hotel rooms just with people who come to look at this stuff. And the, the, the things that they tell us is it's so inconsistent that it's hard for me right. at least to give this advice. I would just say, like, I, I, I would just say um, you may have three options. It may be, like, you're going to negotiate with Comcast and at and It could be that you've got some system and you're going to rent, you're going to lease it out to people. It could be you're going to build your own, whatever. But there's no none of the above. Right. That's that's in the in the ABC list. There's no answer that's none of the above. And as long as everybody starts with the fact that you've got to convene people and figure out what the answer is, and then it has to be an answer that is equitable and gets it to everybody. As long as as long as you start with that, then then I think you're you're okay. Yeah. The the one thing that I'm really starting to um, uh, push cities to think about now is um, rather than focusing on, um, uh, you know, kind of getting low-priced internet for their city, that they should focus on the digital divide and the least advantaged in their city. So keep your powder dry. Don't subsidize the 80% of your city, it might be 70, it might be 90, that are happy to pay and can afford to pay fast, reliable internet. Another fast, reliable gig. Keep your powder dry for that 10 or 15 or 20 percent that you need to help. Put programs, and then you know we like you know we're just starting to work with cities on. Okay, what can a program look like for that last you know percent, 10, 20 percent? You know, and again, the numbers different every city. But there is such a you know which I get. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine how difficult it is to be a politician. Uh, you know, but what a great populist issue to say, I got cheap internet for everyone, everyone. right? But it's... Very good. Sheila? I'm actually going to piggyback off of that response because I know a lot of communities, we are resource constrained and we don't have a 
the millions and billions of dollars to do whatever we want. So thinking critically about where your needs are in your community, using data to identify the neighborhoods that need to be connected, using data to identify the neighborhoods that need wireless hotspots. I think a lot of work can be done on that. And there are a lot of fabulous tools, you know, released by you. New America has done some work around that to giving communities to understand where the real needs are. And second, and breaking the rules, is thinking about how um, love the, yes, <laughs> this digital inclusion work connects to the other priorities that you have in your city. So if you care about economic development, you care about broadband access. If you care about education, you care about broadband access. So I'm going to cheat too and say two things. Um, one, take advantage of the free resources that you have available to you. Next Century Cities is a great resource. Uh, the government has a number of free resources, um, and we we really are there to help and in any way that we can. And two, I think just taking it from a different standpoint, think about, make sure that you're involving your community. So you might have people interested in this issue that you're not aware of, whether you're not involving the libraries or the some of the local businesses. Um, folks, reach out and then um, as part of that sort of stakeholder management as you're building a coalition, you need a champion. So if you're the champion, that's great. But if, if you don't have that, it's not going to move forward. Very true. Uh, can you join me, please, in thanking you?